little girl was drawing a picture of Jonah in the fish's belly when her atheist teacher walked up and said, what's that? She said, it's Jonah in the belly of the fish. He smirked and said, now you know that didn't really happen, right? She said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah about that. He said, and what if Jonah's not in heaven? She said, then you can ask him. (laughs) (laughs) We're glad you're here today. I have a lot of exciting announcements for you. First, Dave Going would like to place membership with us. Praise God for that. Dave has been visiting now for several weeks. We've grown to love him. His son Connor has been visiting as well. We're thankful for that. So if you haven't already, be sure to give Dave a big North Point welcome. Yes. And then, I didn't have time to get their picture up, but I'm thrilled to announce that Gary and Sherry Morris want to place membership as well. Gary said that for six months, we've been looking around, visiting churches. He said the Holy Spirit keeps pointing us to North Point. And so we are thrilled that they're here. They'll be a blessing to us. If you haven't gotten to know them, please do. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we have our Kids Bible Story Hour. We love this work. Kiddos come to read a part of God's Word and to do activities related to what they read. It is an awesome thing to experience. Planning God's, God's Word deep into their hearts in view of eternity. So be sure to be here if you have little ones. If you don't have little ones, promote it to others tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. On the 21st, the guys are going to get together at Bob Naylor's house for the North Point Men Shootout. It's not basketball. <laughs> it's the other kind of shootout. So that's the 21st. Men, we hope you'll make plans for that. Last week, we announced that Hannah Warner had driven almost 1,200 miles from Denver, Colorado to experience North Point. Man. We were thrilled by that. She's been a blessing to us this week. Well, her mom surprised her. (laughs) She showed up this morning. Amy Warner is with us. Be sure to greet her. Hannah gave me a card. It reads, North Point Church. I wanted to extend a huge loving thank you to North Point. It has been an answered prayer to visit, worship, and get to know y'all. I like the (laughs) y'all. Get to know (laughs) y'all. I pray the Lord continues to bless y'all at North Point in your diligent work for him. Love y'all, Hannah Warner. Hannah told me that she is going to move here. Oh, wow. Wow. She, She enjoys being here. She wants to help with our new homeschool academy. And so, just good news on top of good news. We, yeah, praise God for that. It's it's incredible. It's truly incredible what God's doing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, almighty God, we approach your throne knowing that we fall short of your glory, but that you have saved us by your grace and that you love us as a father. We thank you for that. We relish in that. Father, we pray now that our worship is a sweet-smelling sacrifice, pleasing to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our family has had some pretty memorable vacation experiences. A few years ago, we went with Jill's mom and dad to Myrtle Beach, but not long after we got there, they issued a mandatory evacuation order. There was a hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean. It was headed towards South Carolina, And so they forced us to pack up and leave. We weren't sure what to do. We ended up spending about a week in a cabin near Gatlinburg. But that was a pretty memorable moment. And then last year, we decided to vacation up along the Northeast. We went to Philadelphia, Atlantic City, NYC. Well, on the way home, we were driving through a remote part of an interstate in West Virginia when our car broke down. We were miles from any exits. It was getting dark. Very few cars passed by. Here's a picture of a car that did finally stop to help. We spent probably three hours stranded on the interstate. Finally, a tow truck came. He took us to a small town. And the next day, Caleb Ashby came to rescue us in the church van. (laughs) That was definitely a memorable vacation experience. 
but I think Chase, Nora, and Evan might have us beat. Last week, they were on a cruise out in the ocean when someone fell overboard. Check out this video. I see her, I see her, I see her. Where? She's there, she's under the water right now. Right there, she's right there, do you see her? Yeah. She's on top of the surface, she's floating. They need to go straight. She's right in front of their boat. Right! Right! They see her, they're going, they're going, they're going. But did you see them? Yes. I saw her, they're right in front of her right now. They caught her, oh my gosh, they found her. Oh my goodness. She's, she's getting on. They found her. Yeah! Chase later wrote a Facebook post that said in part, just had someone go overboard. As soon as I heard the news, I said a prayer hoping they'd find her. They found her 15 minutes later. I knew immediately that God was watching over her right then and there. It's living proof in the power of prayer. And that's true. But when I saw that, I thought about someone else who went overboard. He didn't fall overboard, he was thrown overboard. I'm talking, of course, about Jonah. Now, Jonah is one of the so-called minor prophets. We know from 2 Kings 14 that he prophesied during the reign of King Jeroboam II. That would have been in the 8th century B.C. But unlike the other minor prophets, this book is more about the prophet than the prophecy. It's more about the messenger than the message. And I know some people have a hard time believing the book of Jonah. They can hardly swallow it. It sounds fishy to them. <laughs> it just gets too deep. I'm not even sorry for all that. <laughs> but listen, some people say, well, maybe the book of Jonah is mythological or allegorical. Let me say definitively, the book of Jonah is historical. It's not mythological, it's not allegorical, it is historical. Aaron, how can you say that with such confidence? Because Jesus verified its truthfulness. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 and 41, listen to what Jesus said. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Notice that Jesus verifies that this is a historical fact. This really happened. Jesus said Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. And notice how he parallels Jonah being in the fish to himself being in the grave. He likens it to his burial and resurrection. Then Jesus said, the men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. It's obvious that Jesus did not consider this to be figurative or symbolic. Jesus considered this to be a real event. The things recorded in the book of Jonah happened. They are true. Well, the book of Jonah, if you're taking notes, can be divided in several different ways. For instance, chapter 1, Jonah and the storm. Chapter 2, Jonah and the fish. Chapter 3, Jonah and the city. Chapter 4, Jonah and the plant. Since the book is about a prophet on the run, you can kind of play off of that word, run, and divide it like this. Chapter 1, running from God. Chapter 2, running to God. Chapter 3, running with God. And chapter 4, running into God. Or if you want to divide the book in half, there's an easy way to do that. Chapters 1 and 2, the great sea. Chapters 3 and 4, the great city. Or you can do it like this. Chapters 1 and 2, grace on the prophet. Chapters 3 and 4, grace on the pagans. Well, we're going to cover the whole book very quickly. 
Let's begin in chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. A prophet is someone who speaks for God. Right? He's God's mouthpiece. And so you would expect the book of Jonah to begin this way. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. He had been waiting for that. And God said, I'm sending you on a great commission. I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. For their evil has come up before me. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrians. It was a massive city. Nineveh had about 600,000 people, large walls, tall towers. It took several days to walk through the city. And the people of Nineveh were notoriously wicked. They wouldn't just kill their enemies. They tortured them in the most heinous ways. The people of Nineveh would impale you on posts, they would bury you alive, they would skin you alive, they would start cutting off body parts. These were terrible people. They represented everything God and His people were against. And so God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach against them. Call them out. But Jonah has to be the worst missionary ever. When God said go, Jonah said no. Nineveh was northeast of Israel. Rather than going northeast, Jonah went about as far west as you can possibly go. He was running from God. Now why would he do that? Why wouldn't Jonah want to go and preach against Nineveh? Was it too difficult? No, it wasn't too difficult. Was it too dangerous? No, it wasn't too dangerous. Then why wouldn't he want to go? Because it was too disdainful. Follow me on this. This is incredible. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach against it because he knew that there's a chance they might repent. And he knew if they repent, God is a gracious God, he'll forgive them. He'll spare them. And Jonah just couldn't tolerate that idea. And so rather than possibly save the people of Nineveh, he was willing to die. He said, I'm going to run away from God. I'd rather die than do that. Well, he boards this ship. They set out for Tarshish when a great storm comes upon the boat. Now, these were experienced fishermen, sailors, right? But even they were terrified. This storm was unusually severe. And as they felt the surging waves and stinging winds, they quickly surmised that this is a God doing this. He must be angry with someone aboard the ship. I think it's so ironic that the pagan sailors are praying to God's. God's prophet is sleeping. Isn't that ironic? The pagans are praying, the prophet is sleeping. Well, one of the men walk over to him and they say, Get up! What are you doing sleeping? We're about to die! They had been trying to lighten the load by throwing their cargo overboard. They were all praying and crying out to their gods. They say to Jonah, Get up! Cry out to your God! Maybe he'll hear us. Well, things just got worse and worse. The boat was in danger of breaking apart. And so the men, in desperation, begin casting lots to determine who the culprit is. And the lots fall on Jonah. They begin to interrogate Jonah. Who are you? What do you do? Where have you come from? And Jonah confesses, I am the culprit. 
this is, this is my God doing that. He's upset with me. Jonah tells the men, I'm running away from God. And so the men are panicking. They ask Jonah, what should we do? How can we get this to stop? Jonah says, throw me overboard. But they didn't want to do that. I mean, if they throw this man overboard, that might make the gods even madder. And so they're trying everything else in their power, but nothing works. Finally, they give in. They take the prophet and they throw him overboard. Jonah is immediately swallowed by a great fish. Now, we all wonder, don't we, what kind of fish was that? Was this some special fish that, that God had prepared just for this moment? Probably. But I did some research. I started looking at the different art arguments. What fish could this have been? And I'm pretty confident that if it was just a natural fish, it was most likely the sperm whale. The sperm whale grows to about 80 feet long. It's been known to swallow entire sharks, seals, squid without tearing into their bodies. Their jaws are made for swallowing their prey, not chewing their prey. I don't know what fish this would have been, but if it was just a regular fish, that probably makes the most sense to me. Regardless, though, God was in control. God made sure that Jonah stayed alive in the fish. And he was in the fish for three days and three nights. Kind of reminds me of the prodigal son. The prodigal son had to hit rock bottom before coming to his senses. That's how it was with Jonah. God couldn't reason with him, so it takes being swallowed by a fish to break through. Mm -hmm. And in chapter 2... In the belly of that fish, Jonah comes to his senses and repents. This is what he prayed. He said, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And so this stubborn prophet has a change of heart, wouldn't you? Okay, God, you win. Enough. I'm being covered in in slime and digestive juices. I can tell that this creature is going high and low. I give up, God. You win. Well, God then has the fish vomit Jonah onto dry land. And once he gets up and cleans off a little bit, God recommissions him. Jonah, I want you to go and preach against the people of Nineveh. This time, he goes. He travels to Nineveh. This is chapter 3. He gets about a day's journey into the city, and he begins preaching. It was a one-sentence sermon. Do you know what he said? In chapter 3, verse 4, he said to the people, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, I want you to picture this. Here is this Jew, this Israelite, among the pagans... And he's preaching, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, if we stop there and pulled the room, most of us would probably say, oh, they're going to kill him. They like to kill people, especially their enemies. But remarkably, they don't kill him. They listen. 
they heed the warning. Now, before we get into that, I want you to notice that it was 40 days, he said. 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. I don't know what it is about the number 40, but God apparently likes it. For instance, it rained during the days of Noah for 40 days. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. The spies were in the land of Canaan for 40 days. Elijah fasted for 40 days. Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days. Jesus appeared alive to his disciples post-resurrection for 40 days. I'm not sure why that is, but God must like the number 40. Chapter 3, verse 5 is one of the most understated verses in the whole Bible. Right after it tells us that he preached in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown, verse 5 says, and the people believed. I want you to think about that. And the people believed. This has to be one of the greatest revivals in human history. Truthfully, I can't think of one greater. Nineveh, as I said, had a population of about 600,000 people. These were cruel, heartless pagans. And yet, in succinct fashion, the Bible says, and the people believed. In fact, it tells us even the king of Nineveh believed. He tore off his clothes, he dressed in sackcloth, he sat in ashes, and he issued a decree that everybody, man and beast alike, were to mourn and repent. Isn't that incredible? When they hear the preaching of, of Jonah, they're all ears. They begin mourning, sorrowing, seeking God's forgiveness. But that's exactly what Jonah had feared. That's why he had run away in the first place. He knew that this might happen. And if it did, God would show compassion. And so as we go into chapter 4, Jonah is upset. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Notice those words in verse 1. He was displeased exceedingly. Not just a little bit, not somewhat. He was displeased exceedingly. Some translations say he was greatly upset. He was very unhappy. He was furious. Try to wrap your minds around that. This is a prophet of God. And he's mad that God has shown grace to Nineveh. He's upset. He says to God, I knew this would happen. This is what I was afraid of. Notice what he said. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love, relenting from disaster. Jonah knew if they repent, you'll relent. And did you notice? He said, take my life. I'd rather die than see that. This is some deep-seated hatred, isn't it? John MacArthur, a commentator, called him a racist prophet with a rotten attitude. Sounds harsh, but he might be onto something. He despised these people. And he hated that God showed him love. I got to thinking about my own life, and could I be guilty of this? I got to thinking, who do I really dislike? And believe it or not, there are a few people. 
One is an extended family member of mine. I actually converted him. But he's the most self-righteous guy I've ever met. Very, very arrogant spiritually. And ever since we started this church, he has made it his mission to destroy it. He tried to get my support cut. He said all kinds of terrible things about us. And so I got to thinking, do I want him in heaven? That's a deep thought, isn't it? He has caused me pain. He has caused my family pain. He has brought reproach upon this great church. Do I want him in heaven? I do. I do. But I'm telling you, there are people in life we encounter who cut us deep, don't they? And if we're not careful, we could fall into the same category as Jonah. We could begin to resent God's goodness forgetting all the while that we're in need of his grace as bad as anybody else. Amen. But that's where Jonah was. And so Jonah goes up on a hill outside of Nineveh, sits down, hoping that God changes his mind, hoping that God wipes him out after all. Well, it was hot. Scorching sun, a very hot breeze blowing. And so God, being gracious, causes this big vine to immediately grow, shading Jonah from the sun. Jonah relished in that. Oh, this is wonderful. I love this vine. This is great. But the next day, God appointed a worm to attack the vine so that it withered away. Now Jonah was upset again. He was hot physically and emotionally. Well, God was using that as an object lesson. You see, Jonah was having a pity party. He felt sorry for himself and for this vine, but he couldn't care less about the people of Nineveh. God's trying to teach him a lesson. And as the book ends, God has the final word. Jonah 4, verses 10 and 11. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? What's God saying there? God's saying, Jonah, this is crazy. You've lost your mind. You pity a plant? You pity a plant? but couldn't care less about people? He mentions 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left. That's probably a reference to young children. There are 120,000 babies in that city, Jonah. Don't you care about them? You're more concerned with a plant than with people? Let me ask you a serious question. Have you ever been guilty of that? More concerned with, with other things than you are with those created in the very image of God. I would love to know how Jonah responded. We're not told. God has the final say. God has the last word. But don't you wonder how Jonah responded? Well, these stories have been preserved for our learning. And there are a lot of lessons for us to learn. I'll give you five quickly. Number one, we learn that we cannot run from God. It's futile. God is everywhere. If you go on the highest mountain, God is there. If you go into the deepest sea, God is there. If you run to the east, God's in the east. If you run to the west, God's in the west. You cannot run from God. Number two, God rules over creation and nations. Number three, we serve a God of second chances. He gave Jonah a second chance. He gave the people of Nineveh a second chance. Now, it's not guaranteed. I think about Ananias and Sapphira. Acts 5, they weren't given a second chance. The young prophet in 1 Kings 13, he wasn't given a second chance. But generally speaking, our God is a God of compassion. He is a God of grace. He is a God of patience. Generally speaking, he gives us time to repent. Number four, we learn about the importance of preaching. 
Preaching is far more powerful than most of us realize. It took me nearly 20 years of full-time ministry to, to appreciate this. But there are people who will come back to me two years or five years or even ten years later and say, Aaron, do you remember back then you preached a sermon on whatever? And I have to say, no, actually I don't remember that. They'll say, well, I do, and I want you to know it changed my life. I was headed in the wrong direction, and that message changed my life. Boy, that, that hits home. There is power in preaching. And we see that here. It changed the whole city of Nineveh. These heinous people repented at the preaching of Jonah. And number five, we have a lesson about the power of repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of life. You make a U-turn. I was going that way, now I'm going this way. It was true then, it's true now. When we repent, God relents. That's powerful. But here's the main message of the day. This is what I've been getting at. The book of Jonah, this great story, is a lesson in God's amazing grace. Amen. He showed grace to the pagan sailors, to the wayward prophet, and to the most wicked nation on the planet. Let me ask you a question. Did any of those people deserve it? No, not one. But that's what grace is. Grace, by definition, is unmerited favor. It is undeserved blessing. And the book of Jonah is a book of grace. Do you realize the story's not really about Jonah? The story's not really about a fish. And the story's not really about Nineveh. The book of Jonah is a book of grace. And I thank God for that. Hear it again from Jonah's own lips. For I knew that you are a gracious God. That's our God. That's the God of heaven, Yahweh. You are a gracious God. You are a merciful God. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You are relenting from disaster. I want you to get that last line. Do you understand, unlike pagan gods who are often angry, our God does not want to hurt us. He, he doesn't want to smite us. He wants to save us. Do you realize that? He is our Abba, our Papa. People say, I don't know about that Bible. In the New Testament, God's so full of love, but in the Old Testament, He was full of anger, hostility, killing people. Really? Is that true? I don't think so. I think the book of Jonah would argue otherwise. Our God is unchanging. He's always been a God of love. Amen. And brethren, here's my final point. The vertical is dependent upon the horizontal. You with me? The vertical is dependent upon the horizontal. If you want God to give you grace, you better be willing to extend grace to others. But they don't deserve it. That's what grace is. And you don't deserve it either. If you want God to give you grace, you'd better extend grace to others. Amen. Aren't you glad that's our God? Amen. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love, relenting from disaster. But maybe you're here today and that's not your God. You say, what do you mean? I mean you've never made him your God. He wants to be your God, but you don't have that relationship yet. Why would you want to turn down that guy? That God. He wants to love you. But he's not going to force you to love him back. 
Do you want a relationship with that God? Then come believing on Him. Believe on His Son, Jesus. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith openly and be immersed in water to have all your past sins washed away. If you'll do that, you'll rise up out of that water, cleansed by the blood and on the road that leads to heaven. That God will become your God. And He'll care for you now and forever. Don't pass this up. If you're subject to the call of the gospel, come as together we stand and sing.